Good day, everybody. I'm Matt Lorenz. Um, and, yeah, well, we're, like John was talking about, um, I also went overseas to learn about Varroa. As soon as we found out Varroa came to Australia in 2022, we basically booked the flights and thought we need to go learn about this thing because, um, yeah, we we've had a pretty good idea it was going to be a big deal, but, um, yeah, we wanted to get some hands-on experience uh, with it. So that's what I'm talking about today. And I'm going to sort of focus a little bit on, because um, I, I think we're probably all in the same boat. We're just sort of waiting to get Varroa at the moment. Um, we don't have it yet, and we don't really know what to do. We can't really trial any treatments because we haven't got Varroa. So I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we can do now already, even though we don't have Varroa, to be a little bit better prepared for when we get it. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off us. Um, and so these are just some things that I learned that they're doing in New Zealand that, that help a lot with their management. So... Yes, I'm not going to use this thing, though. So that's me, Matt Lorenz. Um, I work with uh, part owner of McDonald Honey. We have about 2,500 hives. Uh, and you can see in my backpack there, there's a little sleeping baby. You've probably all been introduced to that baby today. She's been making a bit of noise. My apologies for that. She's over there. Be nice to see her. And <laughs> Um And yes, I work with a beekeeper in Kaiwi, which is on the North Island. Um, and we, yeah, we basically learnt how to treat and manage Varroa in a commercial operation. So, yeah, like I was saying, I'll talk about what we did while we were working with Chris. Some key differences as well. Um, beekeeping in Victoria versus beekeeping in New Zealand. Um, just sort of important for us to think about that, given, you know, we have a complete different honey season here and different honey flows and completely different environments. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, the monitoring techniques we use... The treatments we used, um, the hive management styles they had as well to help deal with Varroa, and any recommendations, actions we can take now. So these are the two people I took with me. On the left there is Dave Stevens, is our apiary manager. Give us a wave, Dave. There he is. And on the right is my wife, Paige McDonald, which you might know from her past experience as an apiary inspector. Um, so yes, we were kitted up in there. Oompa Loompa, Oompa Loompa looking bee suits they have over there and got stuck into it. So what we did, um, sort of different to what we do every time we go to the bees, is we'd go to their loads and we'd do a brood inspection on every single hive. Um, yeah, which is a different method to, to what we do. We don't do a brood inspection each, on each hive every time we go to the bees, um, just a few times a year. And uh, we were looking for varroa symptoms and we actually, Chris was... The guy who we work with, he was a little bit more concerned about finding an AFB, to be honest. Um, but yeah, we're assessing hive health as we go. We do alcohol washes about 10% of each of each load as we were there. We were treating all hives with apivars. So this was in the spring. Oh, sorry, this was in the autumn. This was in uh, March, and so they used apivar as their autumn treatment. Chris had already used Bavarol as their spring treatment, so they weren't doing back to backs because that's really important not to do the back to backs and. Very, they were very much aware of the um, chemical resistance that John was speaking about before, and we sugar-fed everything, which is also something that we just don't really have to do that much here, um, especially because, yeah, we get to leave the supers on, don't have to worry about treatment, but, yeah, sugar-feeding was just a constant thing that they were doing over there. Every time you go to the load, you're sugar-feeding, which is very different to what we're used to. We also did additional treatments of Formic Pro as well, so those were the two main chemicals I worked with, and I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. So the differences in Chris's bees in particular, they're all 10 frame boxes. They, uh, they're mostly two brood boxes, which we just use a single eight frame brood box. I think most people in, um, in Victoria are like that. Uh, the honey supers were three quarter depth. Uh, they used screen bottom boards, they had sugar feeders in all their lids. They had really small acre sizes, which is pretty different to us. There was a roughly about 32 hives per load, which is yeah, significantly smaller. They um, didn't use escapes and stuff, they just blew the bees from the honey, which was a bit weird. Um, and they used a lot of protected queen cells for requeening. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, this is just an, an example of one of their loads. It almost doesn't seem worth it, to be honest. We're driving through these paddocks, opening about 10 gates to get to four pallets of bees. It's a little bit different to our 44 pallets of bees. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, pretty lush. Doesn't really look like that in many of the places we work either. Um, and this is just a, 
a nuke load that Chris had right next to us was just a sheer drop off a cliff. And it gets pretty windy over there and he says he's lost a few bee lids down and once they go over, you're not getting them back, so. Um, and there's some similarities. I'm sure we've all been here before. Um, this happened a bit, actually. We seem to be slipping and sliding all over the place. But yeah, they have similar problems in New Zealand to us. And we dealt with it the same way. Just grabbed the land cruiser out and snatch strapped us out of this bog. But yeah, just, uh, just an example of the fun we were having over there. Um, so yeah, some of the key differences as well. And you know, we're getting most of our information from New Zealand, given they're our neighbours. Um, and so when we're taking in that information, we really need to consider the differences in their industry and our industry, particularly here in Victoria. They have a really short honey season. You know, they, like John was talking about Canada as well. New Zealand's fairly similar. They might have one or two honey flows and it's sort of constricted from November to February. Whereas with us, we can get honey from well, pretty much August to April or sometimes sneaking into May and even at the moment on the banks here. So. There's a lot of differences there we have to consider when we're listening to their advice in terms of what treatments to use and when to use them. Um, it's going to be harder for us to, to find those and identify those treatment windows. Um, and yeah, they just feed sugar for the rest of the year. So that really eliminates the problem of the, the Apival, the Amitraz chemical that we're going to have with uh, treating with honey supers on. Um, they average less honey per season, but it's higher value honey. Um, so they're benefit for them, given they're making a fair bit more money off the Manuka honey, as we all know, um, is they can afford the treatments. So that's something that we need to consider how we're going to manage to afford these treatments. They do kiwi fruit pollination. They, when we were there, I think this has actually dropped off a little bit um, in the last couple of years, but they had almost a million commercial hives within New Zealand. So it's a pretty small space. I'm not sure if anyone actually knows how many we have in Eastern Australia, but I'd be surprised if there's that many. Does anyone know? About 800,000. Yeah, exactly. So. We had a pretty small area in New Zealand, and honestly, we were driving around, because they have these little loads as well, they have bees in every paddock, which is, um, yeah, it was a strange sort of setup. but Chris seemed to think that was a big part of the problem because they had so many beekeepers so spread out all over the place, they'd get a lot of reinvasion from people that weren't treating properly, but hopefully we don't have that problem. It's a little silver lining for us. Um, so yeah, every time we'd go to the load, we'd do a mite count, and um, this is just, just completely part of Chris's practice. Which is just something we'll all just have to start doing. Hopefully we're all doing it already, but it was essentially just just a complete, uh, just a routine, just like lighting the smoker. Um, and yeah, he Chris was completely aware of a range of treatments to use. He had he's, he tried a lot. He's always thinking about it, um, and yeah, always talking to his industry groups about what other people are doing and and any other ideas that people have about new treatments that are working or different ways of rotating the chemicals and stuff like that. Um, he's adapted beekeeping techniques. So Chris, the guy that we worked with, who he was a commercial beekeeper prior to having Varroa. And so he, he's been around a little while now, so it's about 20 or 30 years I think he's been beekeeping. So he was, he's able to adapt different techniques other than just the treatment itself to help him deal with Varroa. Um, he keeps precise records. He had a bit of an issue a few years ago with um, not treating on time and lost a few bees. So he's um, since learning from that mistake he's been using, I think, um, hive, hive tracks, yeah, the software. So that's something that I definitely recommend people to look into, that sort of software. Um, and he, so he records all the details for the site every time on an iPad. So every time we leave, he's diligently writing down what we did, um, when treat, like, you know, what treatments went in, how many hives there were, all that sort of details. He was just, it was the same sort of thing as lighting a smoker. It was just part of his routine. Um, which is something we probably weren't doing as precise prior to going to New Zealand. And then the big bold letters down the bottom there, alcohol wash, alcohol wash, alcohol wash. It's just an absolute no-brainer for them. This is what you do. It's just, because we're going through the hives as well, it was a, we had a good little tip for it. Basically, if you see the queen, do a mite wash on that one because you could put the queen aside. You don't accidentally wash the queen. So um, it was a good little tip for him, from him there. Um, and this was his... Uh, might wash kit, as you can see, he's definitely got his money, money's worth out of that $5 tub. And yeah, so that, it's just, that sort of shows how often he uses it. That's just, he has these in every vehicle and um, yeah, it's just, you're always just lugging it around. So um, we'll, we'll, if we want to be beekeeping successfully, we'll, we'll all have this exact thing. So. And this is the sort of stuff we found. He was, it was sort of a good time for us to go over there because he hadn't had the best season um, in terms of management of Varroa. This was, 2023, I think there was a bit of a Manuka bubble burst just before we got over there. There was a lot of beekeepers 
going out of business, so he said that he had a really big problem with what he believed was a reinvasion because people couldn't afford the treatments anymore, and they were all, as, as I was saying before, bees in every paddock. He was getting constant reinvasion, so there's not going to be, like, he didn't have it quite as bad as um, what Peter was talking about earlier, but um, definitely he was having a lot of troubles keeping that mite level down. So this is the sort of stuff we were finding, which was a gr great opportunity for myself, Dave and Paige, to witness sort of what it's going to look like early on. Um, and yeah, it was, to be honest, I think it was a fair bit of a relief to see this. Uh, you know, Chris didn't care, he's been dealing with a row for 20 years, but in somebody else's hive, before I saw it in one of ours, it's going to be quite an impactful thing finding this sort of mite count, or just mites in general, in your own hive. So that was, yeah, I think it sort of helped us a little bit, just to, well, we'll see. I haven't found it in my hives yet, but um, it, well, I feel like this will help a lot. Seeing it in someone else's hive, dealing with it and thinking about it there before we have that added pressure back at home on our own businesses. So, and this is the sort of symptoms we were seeing as well. So that mite wash you just saw was from this hive. You can see that bee has, a, clearly it's got a varroa on its back there and it's got deformed wings. So that's a, that was a really, really bad hive. Um, he just had one load that just, he couldn't get on top of, but um, he just said he just left it so that we could experience what it's like to have this sort of row, but um, it was actually just because he was a little bit behind, I think, when we got around to these bees, but yeah. Um, these are the, the, one of the treatments, the main treatment we used uh, was Apivar, and um, yeah, thanks Sam. And um, that was a, chemi a chemical treatment. Um, you can't use it with honey supers on, so it's gonna be really tricky for us to figure out how we're gonna possibly use a treatment like this in our operation. It was an eight week treatment, when you put two strips in per brood box, he reckons it was about 90 to 95 percent mite kill, and he alternated with alternated with Bavarol in the spring. So this was part of his chemical treatment process. So Bavarol in the spring, Apivar in the autumn, and then we also used Formic Pro in between to fill in the gaps if he was getting high mite counts in loads as a quicker knockdown. So to get him to that Apivar treatment. So Formic Pro is an organic treatment which. It's crazy to think it's organic because it is pretty harsh stuff. Um, you definitely don't want to breathe it in too quickly because it sends you a bit loopy. But uh, it's okay to use it with the honey supers on. The treatment methods that we were using is uh, he was using either one strip for 10 days and repeated for 20 days or two strips for seven days. Now, so the, the first method there, one strip for 10 days and repeated, that's actually not, that's off label here in Australia. So we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to do anything in Victoria, but in New South Wales, that's off-label. But he seemed to think that that um, had less queens dying using that method um, and less of an impact on the brood. But he also, I don't think it had the same as harsh of, as an effect as the two strips for seven days, but that was just, just another, I guess, tool in the toolbox he was using, depending on the time of the year, depending on the seasonal pressures and all that sort of stuff. One of the big problems for us using Formic Pro is that temperature window. So it's great because we can use it for, with supers on. Unfortunately, a lot of our honey flows are when it's warm and um, you can only use Formic Pro between 10 and 29 degrees. So try to figure out when that's gonna happen. And that mainly for the first three days of putting it in, it's gotta be within that temperature window, but um, yeah, it's pretty hard to figure out when that's gonna be. Uh, the good thing about Formic Pro, it could kill, oh, sorry, not the good thing about Formic Pro, it kills queens of brood, but it can penetrate the brood, so it can kill the mites that are within the brood. But yeah, unfortunately, some of the negatives, there's always a trade-off with these treatments. It, nothing seems to just be a silver bullet. Um, it kills the queens of brood and it can rust metal excluders. So fortunately for some of you people that don't use excluders, I'm not sure how you still manage to be keep without excluders. You know who I'm talking about up there, Lockie. But, um, it's, uh, you, you won't have to worry about this, but um, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely going to be a problem for us. And it, these treatments as well require specific hive ventilation. And so for us, we've been beekeeping for quite a long time at McDonald's. We've got a lot of different setups. You know, we've got bottom boards that are twice as old as I am and um, samples from all over the place. And yeah, there's not, there's not that much of a uniform setup in our hives. So they require a fairly consistent sort of ventilation for these treatments to work properly. So that's something we're going to have to figure out now before we get Varroa. 
So yeah, the main thing I really want to talk about today was um, things we can do now. So this is the stuff that will, if we take these sort of actions, then the pressure of getting Varroa, we're going to be, we're going to be a lot better off. We're going to make a lot better decisions um, if we are already, I guess, starting our journey now. Um, so record keeping seems to be number one, to be honest. Um, it's just so crucial that we're getting the treatments in the right time, taking them out at the right time, um, and then just taking note of how well they're working. Because when resistance starts to build up slowly, you know, this is the sort of data that we want to be able to analyse within our own business and make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, so, and just consistency seems to be key as well. That just, that's what they talk about over there. They're a little bit lucky because they have a more consistent beekeeping season than we do. So I think it's even more important for us to keep records because, you know, we're going to... We're going to have to work out, you know, a messmate might own the hip flower once every four years or so. What's that do for Varroa? You're going to forget in four years' time if you just try to remember what your treatment, how your treatment methods and your IPM might have worked that season. But if you're keeping precise records about that, then you can easily just look it up and you might be a lot better off next time, messmate flowers. So. Uh, seasonal planning as well. Uh, consider your treatment windows when you might have opportunities, um, you know, might be through pollination, you might have it the chance to be able to have eight weeks without honey supers on. Um, it might be, you might have to skip a potentially an autumn honey flow to bring them back and take the supers off to um, treat them with amitraz. So just things like that. So consider your treatment windows when you're doing your seasonal planning. Um, and then developing your hive management techniques as well. So that's just something that um, Chris had just completely just adapted in his beekeeping after 20 years. So that's something, a change that we can start making now before having Varroa, um, and that's things like screen bottom boards, control out, that sort of stuff, um, drone trapping. If you want to know a bit more about that stuff, I'm not an expert on those, an expert on those things, so um, do some Googling, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Um, adapting hardware and setup, learn about treatment options, so I'd highly recommend to everybody to, if you have the means, um, book a flight and go to New Zealand. They're really, really accommodating people over there. Um, we were lucky enough to not just work with Chris and meet a, we met a fair few other New Zealanders while we were over there and they all really wanted to share a, as much as they possibly could with us. Um, so, yeah, I just highly recommend it. And if you want, just let me know as well. Chris really liked having a couple of Aussies over, who knew how to do a bit of beekeeping, over to help him because he was a little bit behind, behind when we got there. So by the time we left, he'd caught up. So he doesn't mind the free labour if anyone wants to get over there. Staff training as well, you know, we should be aware of we've got this uh the video that national um what's it called the national response national program the varroa training program that's coming so get not just you do it get your staff there as well and the most important thing at the bottom there that they've been really doing quite successfully in new zealand is get involved with industry groups so when we're over there i think we had a, a night we just had a barbecue and all the beekeepers in the area come around and everyone just sat there talking about varroa the whole time and their treatment methods and what was working for them and what wasn't. I think that's really, really important for us um, if we want to, especially for the first few years. You know, we're all going to be doing things different. We've got a lot of stuff we can learn from each other. Um, and, yeah, I think if we can, if everyone just gets together, with, especially using those industry groups, get together and talk about what is working for you, um, it's going to help your neighbours. And if you help your neighbours, it's going to help you because of the reinfestation. So that's really important. And yeah, so this is just an example of um, keeping precise records. So see the photo there with the, um, the bumblebee? That's one of Chris's ways of keeping precise records. Really simple, but it's just writing on a lid. The lid's not going to go, in, well, ideally, unless it fl flies off a cliff, which does happen to him sometimes. But ideally, um, the lid's going to stay on that hive. You write the date the treatments go in, write the dates they come out. So simple. It's a great spot to start. And another thing he used it for was his mite counts. So he'd, every time he'd do a mite count, he'd just write it on the lid. It's basically a, note, a notebook that's always on the hive. So it's a really good option. And use software as well, like I was saying before. This is just an example that we use. It was an app that um, we developed that just, just keeps the details we want. I know it's really hard with um, beekeeping in Victoria and Australia. We all do it fairly differently. So it's hard if you try some of this software. It doesn't really seem to fit that well for your specific business. But um, so yeah, if you've got a little bit of spare time, like I managed to have, develop your own app, but otherwise just do a bit of shopping around. 
um, yeah, train your staff and develop season plans, like I was saying before. This is just an example of our season plan and just a quick one that I whipped up. Um, and you can see down the bottom there, I've just started to add. You can just probably a bit small to read, but um, there's like a little bit of red, then a green line. Just started to add treatment windows in when we're doing our planning. Um, yeah, just starting to think about it now, but just because who knows when it's just going to pop up in our hives. So um, just definitely something to start thinking about. And yeah, your management. So requeening regularly is something that they do very diligently over there. Um, they do it so often that they had to come up with sort of more efficient ways um, than, than we do. We use, we use either cages, or typically use cages, um, but they requeen. So regularly they start using protected queen cells. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of protected queen cells before, but I've never actually really seen one in action. It was as simple as a queen cell, you wrap a little bit of tape around it and put it in. And the idea is the queen can't chew in from the side. Um, and so you have the virgin hatch out. The theory is the virgin queen that hatches out will kill the old queen because they're better at fighting and you'll have a new virgin in that hive. So it just saves you a lot of time. You don't have to go in there, find the queen and kill her. I'm definitely not vouching for this method because I haven't tested it myself, but they did that. They, most of them said that they, this works just as efficiently as, um, or just as successfully as just putting in cages and stuff like that. So definitely worth a try. Um, and yet, also on that too, they were talking about breeding for viral resistance. It probably wasn't that big of a topic over there, but definitely something that we can start thinking of now before we have varroa is, you know, what methods will our queen breeders use for breeding for varroa resistant traits and supporting those queen breeders. So if they are saying they're doing it, if they're advertising for it, if they're um, showing, you know, showing the methods, definitely support those queen breeders and buy those queens. A really big one is, um, which we're going to have to deal with a lot, they had a pretty simple system over there because Chris had the full depth frames as brood frames and the three quarter frames as honey frames. He never really got tempted to um, put the, swap them around. Uh, but for us, we just use all full depth frames. So we're starting to try to work out a system for rotating frames because as John spoke about before, the build up of those chemicals is a big problem within the frames. So if you're treating in the brood box, and the chemicals come in contact with your different brood frames, then there's just going to be trace amount of chemicals left in those frames. I'm not sure if there's a specific timeline put on it or not, but the New Zealanders seem to think about four or five years is as long as you want to have a brood frame in a uh, hive four before there's too much chemical build up on them. Um, and then when you are, when you do need to take them out, you can't put them up in your super, which I know is a real nightmare because it's just really common practice for us. In the spring, to help with the swarm and open up the hive, we just take the two wall frames out that are honey. We just either put them in the super or take them home and extract them. It's a really common way, method of beekeeping, but unfortunately with these chemical treatments, that's a, that's a way of beekeeping that we won't be able to do anymore. So coming up with a system now, once again, it'll be a hell of a lot easier than thinking, of, thinking about it now than it will be when we've got varroa. And yeah, like I said before, adapt the hive wear, try out screen bottom boards if you're not already, try out excluders if you're not already, and, um, and deep bottom boards or ideals for drone trapping, just like Peter mentioned earlier. So try out these methods now, start to adapt them, and it's going to make your life a lot easier. So yes, like I've really harped on enough, now if we're prepared, we're going to be much better off. The first few seasons are probably going to be pretty difficult, so just do whatever we can to ease the pressure, and it's not the end of the world. Successful beekeeping is still happening in all countries with Varroa, so it'll keep happening in Australia as well. Cheers.